I'm Josh Harris. Welcome to Every Story Matters, where I interview people who are sharing their stories, getting a message out into the world, and really owning their own voice. I'm so excited to be talking to Andrew Pledger today, who is a photographer who is using photography to bring attention to the issue of religious trauma. Religious trauma is part of his own story and his own journey, and he's using his art to dig into that and to connect with other people on this issue. So I'm going to add Andrew to the conversation right now, if I can figure out how to do this. <laughs> there he is. Awesome. Hey, Andrew, hey. how are you? I'm doing good. How are you, Josh? Fantastic. Fantastic. Happy New Year to you. Oh, yes. Thank you. Oh, yeah. This is all so surreal to me. Um, thank you again for letting me be on your show. When I reach out to you, I'm like, he's just going to overlook this, but I'll try and see what happens. So I oh, I'm so glad you. you did. I'm so glad you, you took the initiative yeah. and um, and just uh, and that you're you're putting your your work out into the world. I just think that's always that's always such a brave step, and I I, I love that. Oh, thank you. I'm just, I just want to let you know this is like way out of my comfort zone. I don't like FaceTime calls. I don't <laughs> like talking on the phone. I am such an introvert. So. Oh gosh. <laughs> well, so you know, thanks for be being. Best. You know, thanks for being brave. I, you know, it's it's so interesting because um, when you have something you want to share with with other people and you know you're an artist mm -hmm. it would just be so nice if you could just kind of like put that out there and then hide <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah in the, in the corner in some way but uh it, it really does take courage so i appreciate you doing that yeah, i guess i just you. love to to start by by asking you about your your story how you mm -hmm. grew up you know, obviously, religion is a, a big part of your, your journey and now your art. Yeah. So would you just talk a little bit about your, your upbringing? What was that like? Yes. So I've had many conversations on this, and they've been like three-hour conversations. So I'm just going to try to break it down as much as I can. Yeah. Um, so I grew up in fundamentalist Christianity. Mm. My church would label itself an independent fundamental Bible church, like KJV only, only women can wear skirts, blah, blah, all that kind of stuff, extreme right. type thinking. Um, yeah, that counts, as, that counts as fundamentalist for sure. Yes, it does. <laughs> I'm like, Ugh. Anyways, um, so my parents, they went to Hiles Anderson. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that college, but they were big mm. in the 80s with the fundamentalist okay. movement, Hiles, right. Hiles Anderson. Um, they both met there. Um, my mom she studied English. She was a Christian school teacher for a while. My dad was a pastor for a while, mm. too. Um, he actually ended up leaving the ministry because he was so miserable. Um, oh, no. it, yeah, so my mom hated the Christian school environment, and she decided, I am going to homeschool all of my children. And, you know, there are positives to homeschooling, and there are definitely negatives to it. Um, yeah. I look back at it and there were positives to it that I got to explore what my interests, which is why I feel like at 21, I already feel like I know what my purpose for my life is, which I think is incredible because I see a lot of people my age and they have no idea what they're doing. Right. So I feel like that's why I'm grateful for it. But then again, there was a lot of isolation too. Yeah. And I was, my life was a fundamentalist environment. Like I was socialized, but I was socialized in the church. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, as a child, you know, I thought it was normal. You know what I mean? It's, it's all you know, right? Yeah. It's all you know. And so I remember as a child, I was so brainwashed by fundamentalism that I thought my neighbors, and I think one of my neighbors, she's watching this right now, I started joining, <laughs> but I thought her and her family were evil because they were Methodist. To like, <laughs> oh gosh, <laughs> okay. I'm so sorry for ever thinking that that they're watching this still. I'm like, is I cringe at some of the things I used to believe sure. and the way I used to look at people and yeah, you know. And thankfully, I was able to see through it. Um, and I think what happened to me, what made me realize how harmful the fundamentalist mindset is, was when I got older, um, I started questioning my sexuality when mm. I was around 13 years old. 
And I was so confused about it because I was always told that, you know, all gay people are perverts. Um, yeah. They're going around, they're raping children, they're trying to convert them to their lifestyle or whatever, all these awful, terrible things. Um, and oh gosh, and like all the, my pastor would always go on and on about the Sodom and Gomorrah story in, in the yeah. Bible all the time. And like, it was, it was a fire and brimstone kind of church. And, you know, they you were, must have been so, you must have been so scared when you started asking those questions and being honest with yourself. Yeah, because like it was, it was a moment of cognitive dissonance for me because I was always taught as a choice. But then what I, what I was experiencing was against what I've been taught and I, what I believed. And so there was a disconnect. I'm like something, they're not telling the truth about this issue yeah. here or they're just wrong on it. Yeah. And as I got older and I struggled so much with my mental health mm. and I talked a lot about that in the past and I think I didn't know it at the time because I didn't, I wasn't aware, but I was struggling with religious trauma. Mm. And I think that when I actually labeled it was probably with religious trauma was I think around a year ago, but I knew I had experienced religious abuse and toxic things in the church, but I didn't have the religious trauma thing. And there were so and, many And could things. you just talk, could you just talk for a second? Because, um, it's interesting, sometimes we don't have the language oh, to yes. explain our, our lived experience, yes, you know, like right. we don't even, we don't even have the words to, I mm -hmm. mean, when you're a kid growing up in, in the church, you might not even, you not, might not even be able to say, I'm, I'm gay, like you might not even yeah. be able to know, you know what yes, I'm saying? That's so true. But, but for you, like what was, like you look back now and you call it religious trauma, but what were the experiences, like what were the daily kind of moments or the, oh, the those okay. moments where you felt mm. so there were some symptoms of my mental health that I kept a secret because mm. I was always told that mental health it was the devil it's always demons just read your bible and pray yeah. and you'll be fine and I was doing all the things that the church was telling me and nothing was working mm. and it's just you know and I thought you know that it was my fault basically. And yeah. I feel like that's what I think is so toxic about the fundamentals environment is everything that happens to you is your fault. Mm -hmm. Any negative thing, it's always you. You're a wicked, awful, disgusting sinner deserving of hell, blah, blah, blah. It's your fault. Mm -hmm. And so because of the teachings in the church, um, I have such this negative mindset of myself. And like for people who don't know what religious trauma is, uh, first trauma is a response to a distressing event where you just can't cope with it. Mm -hmm. And like um, and I have index cards here to help me remember things. Just that's great. You know, just that's great. Me. That's fantastic. So communicate what I need. But like, you're doing a great job, by the way. Like I've had, okay. I've seen people already comment. Like you're doing awesome, Andrew. Uh, so, <laughs> so be encouraged, man. Oh, awesome. So like symptoms of religious trauma, especially what I experienced, is reduced ability to think. Critical thinking is suppressed. Mm -hmm. Negative beliefs about yourself and the world. Trouble making decisions. Um, feelings of depression, anger, grief. You have lack of pleasure, you have chronic shame, you feel isolated, and even like symptoms of like PTSD, which is like mm -hmm. nightmares and disassociation. Mm -hmm. And when I read this, I was like, oh my gosh, these are all the things I've been struggling with. They told me it was demons, but the conditioning yeah. I experienced in the church and like things I didn't talk about for a long time, especially disassociation. Um, you know, most of my childhood was just a fantasy dream world. I would just disassociated because I couldn't physically escape my environment. I couldn't physically escape my church. So daydreaming and just disassociating was the only way to do it. Mm. And because of all the toxic things that I heard about the LGBTQ community at church and at home, I had so much hate for my self I could not mm. thought think like the thought of just being me was awful right and eventually and you know I was so scared to talk about it and it's really crazy but my mind started to develop a different identity because I could not deal with who I was and it's crazy it's something you see in the movies that you see and like split but it's like it's mm. not what they portray in the movies necessarily um, but I would go around and live my life thinking I was someone else. And I would come home and look at the mirror and be shocked at who was there, standing there. 
And I'm like, well, this is crazy. What is wrong with me? Something, this is not okay. And as I, as I continued experiencing that and struggling with disassociation, um, you know, I had one instance in my childhood where um, I heard voices, actual mm -hmm. like, and the, and, and psychology, this is called auditory hallucinations. Mm. And this happens to people, um, it can be because of disassociative identity disorder, it can be because of uh, PTSD, it can be because of traumatic events or whatever, and they still don't know why exactly it happens, but it's mm. really scary. And I was mm. afraid to come out and talk about it because hearing voices, like, come on, like, they'll accuse sure. me of being yeah. demon, they're going to accuse me of being demon possessed or something, so I can't talk. Right. And thankfully, that only happened to me one time, and mm. it was so real to me it was like every sound around me blocked out and all i could hear was voices and i was like this is and it lasted a few minutes i'm like i just thought at the time i'm like wow something is i thought something was inherently wrong with me you know mm. what i mean like something because yeah. you know that's what i was taught i was like oh wow i'm just so messed up and as i continue getting older and realizing the damage because because of my beliefs mm. and I was so like inundated with it. It was ingrained in me. It's not something that I could just get rid of. Like when I was able to get out of it and see that what they said of the LGBTQ community wasn't true, it's mm. still those hateful messages were still in my mind. And because you so, received them so consistently. I mean, I, I think that the thing that really breaks my heart is I hear your story and I know so many, so many other people have experienced is that when you're in, a high control environment mm. where it's your family, your family is also your school, mm. and then you know your yeah. religious community. You don't have any way to mm. be honest about the questions you're asking. Talk mm. about the things that you're feeling. Like you're so alone. That's the thing that I that I hear you describing. Oh, yes. You know, mm. just that aloneness and not mm. you know that that inability to to be real with the people around you, yes. be real, even be real with yourself. Yes. I, 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 I just want to say for anybody that's listening and facing big challenges, I mean, I'm, I'm not a therapist, I'm not a psychologist. <laughs> I know you want to, to study that, but please, if you're, if you're experiencing yes. these kinds of things, mm -hmm. reach out for help, Most talk definitely. to a professional counselor, mm -hmm. talk to a therapist, that's, that's so important. But oh, I, I yes. guess I want to kind of go ahead a little bit in your story, Andrew, and, and talk about, I mean, you're still young, you're 21 years old. Yes. Um, what was the what was your moment of of kind of stepping away from mm -hmm. that environment? I mean, here you're on Instagram Live <laughs> talking about this. Uh, what has that been like for your relationships with your family? Like, how how is that? What has that journey been like? So I would say, what kind of started the journey for me was you know at 16 years old, I had left my old church to try mm. to find a healthy environment, healthier mm. church environment, like. You know, I want people to know I genuinely tried to save my Christian faith, but I did. Mm. It, it ended up not working out for me. I tried mm. to, and you know, de deconstructing was what I needed to go on a path of healing. And so, I was at a different church, and like, I'm not going to go into all the details because I know we have limited time. But basically, I got shunned from that youth group because people started spreading rumors about me and my LGBTQ identity. So mm. after that, that was really traumatic <laughs> as a teenager, yeah. just having all these friends one week. And the one week you have no friends anymore. I would have had no friends at all. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So after that, my re my trauma response to that was ultra independent or ultra yeah ultra independence. Mm. And yeah, I kind of took on the attitude where I don't have to depend on anyone. I can do things myself. I will never ask for help. I will isolate. Wow. Yeah. It's so unhealthy. <laughs> yeah. But that was kind of my way to deal with it. And so when that happened. I decided, you know what, I'm stepping away from conservative Christianity. That's just what I'll do. I mm. will, I'll stop soul winning. I'll stop going to youth group things. I'll just, I'll get a job and I'll just I'll use that as an excuse. Cause I knew people would try to shame me if I stopped getting involved and my job was my excuse for not being involved. Right, interesting. So for me, the funny thing is I got a job at Chick-fil-A actually. <laughs> the ironic <laughs> thing, <laughs> wow. It just, but, and the thing was, is that, you know, my parents were okay with that because they thought that it was this perfect 
conservative Christian environment, which is not, thankfully, thank God. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, I guess it didn't completely help you because they are closed on Sunday. So you lost that excuse to be, yeah, but Um, still, it's a step, right? So a lot changed because of that job. And I met so many incredible loving and accepting people people who were still christians but they were more on the liberal side mm. and people even there i was surprised at how many lgbtq people were at chick-fil-a i was like whoa this is i'm shocking. sure yeah i was like okay so it was my safe place wow. um my senior year of high school like it was like the best year of my life which i knew was kind of sad that my fast food job was that but no I you know that's that's i mean it's beautiful you were finding actually a, a safer place with with people yeah. who could actually care about you and, and love you for who you were that's mm-hmm. awesome yeah so and the thing that was hard for me was like my parents they wanted me to go to pensacola christian college mm. which I'm, I'm sure you've heard of them before sure. yeah. they're an extremely fundamentalist college and the thought of that just made me sick and my brother he graduated from there he loved it he's totally bought into the fundamentalist stuff Mm -hmm. so you know that's his choice his life yeah not for me sure but and i just i it's so cult-like because you know they control everything there it's like you can't even go to your own church at pensacola they have their own church on campus for all the students and i'm like no oh wow okay i am not doing that and so you know and also they didn't really have what i was looking into studying there so my parents, I, I asked them, I was like, you know, because they would only pay for Christian college, like, what about Bob Jones University? And which, of course, I was still kind of like, Ugh, like still, but it was better. <laughs> and they're like, okay, we'll, we'll help you pay for that. That's fine. And so by the time I got closer and closer to it, it, I was still so nervous about it. I'm like, can I make it four years? in this still conservative Christian environment. Mm -hmm. And that was when I decided to tell my mom about my struggles with my own sexuality. And, you know, she was so upset and crying. And I told her that, you know, this is not my choice. That's just a part of who I am. Mm -hmm. And, you know, then she was like, okay. She's like, well, you're still going and they can help you. (laughs) Oh, wow. So she was wanting to send you to to Bob Jones at that point? At that point, yes. And like, okay. the, the freaky thing was, is that they had, my parents had said to me, they're like, you know, if you were going to Bob Jones to say the Bible, we wouldn't want you to do that because they don't take a KJV only stance. We don't like that. We don't think that's right. Oh, so like, Bob Jones was too, even a little too liberal for them. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> I was like, whoa. Okay. Yeah. This is. Sure. So flash forward to Bob Jones University, um, my freshman year was hell it was so you awful. did go to bob jones i'm still there <laughs> like oh. i i go back <laughs> you're still go, you're still going to bob jones i know i i go back tomorrow for my last semester actually <laughs> and i'll tell you this story you see people who are watching this need to understand I don't know all these aspects of your story. I had no idea that you were finishing up at Bob Jones. That's incredible. Yeah, but anyways, I don't know what time it is, but I'll try to <laughs> well, explain. No, this is fantastic. I just want to make sure we get to talk about your your photography soon. That's the only yeah, thing. I'll, I'll make sure we, we give time Got for that. You. So, so you are are you openly gay at at Bob Jones? Um, to certain people, to close friends, and like amazing and, and like i don't change the way i dress for people i can be very flamboyant with my outfits and people i get so many side eyes on the sidewalk i'm like yes thank you <laughs> <laughs> i wear the tightest most crazy pants sometimes people just laugh at me i'm like go ahead and laugh like i'm so much more confident than you <laughs> like <laughs> i um, love it i love it that's so funny but you know for me you know um a critical moment at bob jones university was you know people spread rumors about me my freshman year there were a group of guys who had followed me around and harassed me and bullied me and called me faggot and stuff like that Mm. and it's just like we're not in high school anymore like please like can we not do this and it was just so ridiculous and like i know it's the environment they grew up in they were encouraged to treat people like that so so at the end of my freshman year you know i got tired of not belonging I felt I was surrounded by so many people, but I was so alone and I was so isolated. 
And, you know, I got to the point where, you know, I had struggled with depression through all my teen years, but I had never been this low in my life. Yeah. Um, you know, and I was so close to ending it all. Like I even mm -hmm. made my own suicide video oh, that gosh. I was going to send to my parents when it was over. But a part of me, there was still a small part of me that felt like there was hope. And I mean, I felt hopeless because in the environment I was in, I was always told that fundamentalist Christianity, like we're, we're better than the world. We're the most loving people. I'm like, oh, if that's true, that's sad because they're terrible to yeah. me and the LGBTQ community. They're awful. Yeah. And, you know, after, honestly, just making this suicide video just helped me process a lot of things. I cried so much. There were just so many repressed emotions and things mm. inside. I was like, okay. I feel a lot better now. And like I ended up calling Trevor Hotline and they helped me with get through that. And, and just for, for people who might be listening and not know about Trevor, Trevor is oh, yes. a, a group that helps LGBTQ youth in particular, just with counseling and support. Is that right? Yes, that is true. Yes. Um, so yeah, they really helped me. And what I decided to do after that was to seek a church that was affirming and even though that's not allowed at Bob Jones, you're not allowed to go to churches that are affirming and accepting mm -hmm. of everyone, really. You're supposed to go right. to these super conservative, fundy, and like sometimes I think there's like one Presbyterian church on their list, which I don't, I've never experienced that, but I don't expect it to be any better. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but at this church I went to, um, I met an incredible family. And like I ended up taking an Uber to this church, Josh. Like I was so desperate, I couldn't have a car. I was like, I don't know what's going to happen at this church, but I need, I need something. I need community. And when I got there, it was the first time in my life I had experienced a feeling of love and community in a church, a, oh, a feeling wow. of safety. And, you know, I met a family there and I told them my situation and they lived right across the street from Bob Jones. They took me into their family as one of their own. They gave me a key to their house. Oh, my and goodness. I was able to walk away from the campus when I could and go to their house and sometimes eat dinner with them like they were my own family. And it was a whole different experience for me. It just felt incredible to be able to be open about who you are, to be able to talk about your emotions. And, mm -hmm. you know, I love, I do truly love my family. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've tried to have so much compassion for my parents and the way that they were raised. And, you know, as I look back on my childhood, it, my family was so emotionally dysfunctional. We never talked mm. about any emotions. We wow. weren't allowed, like, we weren't allowed to have opinions because, you know, their fundamentalist Christianity was right about everything, blah, 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 and all this. So it was just walking on eggshells all the time. Mm. And, and, you know, like, I don't know. It was, it was hard to deal with not being, and, like, we weren't allowed to express anger. So, like, all these years of having to repress emotions, it's, like, it's right. so unhealthy. I just think and, it's so, I, I just want to pause and say, I love the fact that you're still seeking to have empathy toward mm, your family. I think that's mm -hmm. incredible. Yeah. I also, I, I, I know that there are going to be Christians who are watching this and I, and I know that they hate getting lumped in with, you know, really hateful fundamentalist, mm -hmm. you know, kind of religion yeah. and so on. And I, and I, I just want to celebrate the fact that this family, this Christian family in that church yeah, really expressed love to you. It was and incredible. I'm so grateful that there are so many Christians like that yes. out in the world. Mm -hmm, there and are. I just want to thank them and, and encourage yes. them to, to keep doing that. But the difference that that made for you, mm -hmm. never having experienced that kind yes. of love and acceptance mm -hmm. as a gay person, never yes. having been in a church where you felt that kind of, I mean, I just think it's so beautiful that they, that they reached out to you in that way. Yeah, it, it was incredible. Um, and, you know, and I've let them know, it's like, as I've been growing, especially in 2021, I've been letting people know who were a big, who made a big influence in my life. I'm like, I want to know you made a big influence and That's I so am good. who I am because yeah. of you. And, you know, I tagged them as my posts. I'm like, I don't think I would be here if I would ever met your family. You saved my life and wow. I will forever be grateful for that. Um, That's so beautiful. So... That's tell me I, about so i want to just take a minute here sorry yes. because no don't be sorry you first of all you're a fantastic communicator you're doing a great <laughs> job telling your story it's got to be one of the, the my favorite conversations i've ever oh, had that's great because it's just blowing my mind on so many levels um what was the moment where you realized that 
I want to try to tell the story of religious trauma. I want to try to express this mm -hmm. with photography. Like what was the yes. kind of aha moment for you? So what another reason I stayed at Bob Jones was I discovered fine art photography. I felt a calling to it. And art photography is just, it's the kind of photography where you use it as a medium to express your thoughts, your ideas, and your emotions to communicate powerful messages. Incredible. Through expressing it through art. And they have this, this, this program at Bob Jones that you're um, in. Yes. I mean, they have, I'm a visual arts major. So um, okay. my concentration is in photography and like digital art and that kind of stuff. So right. yeah, I'm an art, yeah, I'm an art major, big shock to there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I'm such a stereotype, but it's whatever. <laughs> oh no, that's not true. It's great. Oh, uh, it. that's funny. But I met a teacher there and she made a big influence on my life. And I think she did. She's never told me that, but I think she did notice that I was different and yeah. she reached out and she sparked a love inside of me for photography that has never gone out since then. And I've been on a quest to discover, I'm like, what do I want to say to the world with art photography? Yeah. And I discovered this around back in May, actually, of 2021. Mm. Yeah. Um, I have been silent about my religious experiences for a while because, you know, I was still processing them of what happened sure. to me. And I just didn't want to go and rant on the internet like, oh, blah, blah, blah. I want it to be concise mm. and be able to see it from different perspectives because I feel like that's so important and when that's yeah. such an issue with the fundamentals of perspective is they don't know how to see from different people's perspectives it's true and that's so important for empathy and that's one of my big issues with the fundamentalists but um it was back in May it was after I had met with a biblical counselor and uh which ooh, that was a big mistake but um <laughs> yeah <laughs> I couldn't afford a therapy and so I went into biblical counseling and I had the, I expected the worst and that's what I got. Oh boy. Um, and so, and the thing is I was disciple for a semester. Hmm. Actually, so I decided to, cause I'm like, you know, part of me did it. Cause I'm like, you know what? If I'm going to leave Christianity, I'm going to know it perfectly. Hmm. I'm going to know if I'm going to be, I need to be a hundred percent sure about this until I actually leave it. And so after I was discipled and at the end of, the discipleship he wanted to change it into trying to change my sexuality so changing it into conversion therapy okay. and so after the first session you know i have been healing from depression from a major depressive order from like seven months already so i'm like yeah. i'm already so many sorry already so depleted and after the first session i already felt strong suicidal feelings and my intuition oh, my intuition was saying you need to stop this this is not healthy and yeah part of leaving Christianity has been me listening to my intuition because in the past mm -hmm. it is something I had just suppressed you know just read the bible pray blah blah, blah. yeah but my intuition was telling me to stop it and I said okay I will never ever do this again this is not healthy this is not mm -hmm. okay and so I texted him and I thanked him for the time that he spent with me showing mm -hmm. me Christianity and discipling me and I told him I did not think it was something that was healthy for me mm -hmm. and I think it is harmful and he texts me back. He's like, let's have a conversation about this. And I said, no, I'm like, I am setting my boundary with you. Good for you. talking about this. Again, yeah. it is not healthy. And if you want to continue to do this to other people, that's fine. But you're not doing this to me. Right. And, and that was the moment where I was on a quest since this is since May of last year. I was on a quest. I'm like, I'm going to do everything I can to destroy my Christian faith because it is... I can't untangle the nastiness from it. Like mm. there are things in Christianity that I think are inherently harmful, mm. especially like the doctrine of hell and how they used to mm. scare people. Mm -hmm. That was a, in like the rapture, the end times and all these things they use and just the guilt, the shame and manipulation. So up to that point, you were trying to like, you were trying to get discipled. You were trying yes. to find a way to kind of make it work. And, and after was. that point, you're like, no, I'm, I'm just out and I'm, I'm moving no. on. I'm like, you know, I have been back and forth about Christianity before but I had never done my own research because like mm. once I found out, Josh, that the Bible is full of so many errors, <laughs> you know, and like I was always told the Bible was inerrant. So when I found out that there were so many errors in the Bible and there's a book on it, I forgot what it was called, but I was able, I literally have a Bible of under, highlighted with mistakes <laughs> that I have for my own because if my parents or if anyone come at me, I'm like, listen, this is what I have. The Bible is not yeah. inerrant. Don't tell me it's perfect because it's not true. That is a lie I was told since birth. <laughs> like, it's not true. 
So when I found it, it's not an errant. Okay. And when I found out that Egyptian mythology greatly influenced the Old Testament, it's like, like okay, wow, like this is kind of like plagiarized. So, so really, you're kind of chipping away at the, the, the sense of total authority and power that this has over yeah. your life at this point. Yeah, because like they had such a hold on me of fear with a Bible and with a God. Like for mm. me, my view of God, he it has a bat and he would beat me at any second if I did anything wrong. Mm. And so I had just this hateful and I'm like, how do I how do I start living my life in fear? How right. Do I, and so in order to do that, I had to deconstruct it completely. Right. And throw it away. I, I shattered it in pieces and I threw it in the trash can because yeah. I was sick of it. And it was killing it, you. That that, it was that version me. of religion was mm -hmm. killing you, literally. Yeah. And you know, and I knew when I told my parents, I knew they would be heartbroken because they spent their entire life shoving this in my brain. And you know, when I told my dad, I told my mom about it, she, she's a wonderful, incredible human being, human being, mm. and I love her dearly. Mm. Um, you know, she's, she's amazing, but she was born in that environment, so she used the same tactics that the fundamentalists used to get me back. She told, she tried to scare me back into Christianity by saying that I would end up homeless on the street and that I would be on drugs. Mm. <laughs> And I was like, I'm sorry, I don't think that's going to happen. And I'm like, you can't scare people back into Christianity. Yeah. That's not how it works. It's supposed to be right. about love. And I tell the people, I'm like, my foundation of faith, it was fear, manipulation, and guilt. There was no love at the foundation of it. Yeah. And, you know, like, I, I made a proclamation of faith five times throughout my life. Five times of asking Jesus into my heart. Mm. And I've done it five times. And I left. And, you know, I don't feel the Holy Spirit like tugging at me like i don't feel any of that what they would tell me like these scare you so much like the holy spirit's gonna get you i'm like if i let him like i'd rather die at this point like i don't mm. care i'm suffering 24 7. yeah this is, this is like psychological torture i cannot deal with this anymore and like the sad thing is is that i couldn't tell anyone about it i couldn't tell my parents i couldn't tell my family because mm. you know they would get so defensive about their religion that you know they would put the blame on me so i'm like okay well, they weren't wow. even willing to, I mean, I, they weren't even willing to really listen and understand. They just were yeah. instantly going into attack mode and, and manipulation mm. mode. Yes. I, I just, I just want to make sure we talk about your art. That's the Sorry. one thing. Cause I, cause I want people to, <laughs> I want people to, to follow your account, which mm -hmm. is, it starts with a four instead of an yes. A. So it's Andrew Pledger, but it's, mm -hmm. it's four yes. at, at the beginning. So, cause I had a yes. little trouble finding you today. I'm sorry. Um, yeah. No, no. It's a, it's very. I like. I love the way the four looks like an incomplete A. It's very cool. Uh, okay. Um. But I I want them to see some of your your photography and your mm -hmm. work. Yeah. But I'm just curious. Like, what are some of the ways with the photography that you're trying to portray this religious trauma or even mm -hmm. disassociation or these these kinds of mm -hmm. of concepts? What has that been been like for you? Yes. So, when I I'm trying to think of when I actually start, I think oh, okay, it was the beginning of my senior year. Um, I had my internship with my teacher, um, the one who had helped me through all these years. She created yeah. her own little internship for me, and she gave me the freedom to create my own portfolio. And I went straight a, a photo series um, around religious trauma. And like, I mean, honestly, I can't, I probably spent like 60 or more hours on it, doing it wow. and putting it together. And, you know, I've done it very carefully. You know, I've been very precise in planning mm. everything of what I wanted to say, what messages I wanted to portray in the photos. Yeah. Um, and I was like, you know what? I think I've been working on this since September and I published it on the, or put it on the internet January 2nd. It's out on my page now. Congratulations. Um, <laughs> that's awesome. Is that, is that on your, your Instagram uh, page? Yes, it okay. Is. That's and where people if, can see it. Yes. And then if you look at my highlights, it's, there's a highlight. It says my story. That's why I decided. And it's also in religious trauma. I have a highlight for that too, is in there. Amazing. And, you know, I realized, you know, I was so afraid of putting it out there. And that's when I knew that I had to, because yeah. artists, art is supposed to be controversial. It's supposed yeah. to make people think and question things. So, you know, I decided to take a whole break from Instagram and posting. I'm like, hey, y'all, I'm working on a big photo series. A lot of things are going to change in 2022. I was like, I will wow. see y'all then. <laughs> so, 
I would you describe one of your pieces and and kind of the meaning behind it? I mean, I know we can't. I don't think oh, you have sure. one that you can hold up. But yeah, I do. Not. Maybe you can you can describe one and mm -hmm. kind of explain the significance. Mm -hmm. So the gist of the series, the message that I wanted to tell is that you are the answer to your problems. You are your own hero. Mm. And how I did that was through this person. They're locked away in a room and all they have basically is like a bed and a cross and a wall and a Bible wow. and that's all they have. And for me, it just kind of felt like internally, that's how I felt like my childhood was. I just had these things to rely on. Yeah. And this person is struggling with so many mental health issues and the religion is not helping them at all. It's not doing anything. They're just mm. falling, they're getting worse. And to me, that represents to me how I was falling deeper, deeper into religious trauma. Yeah. And, and in this story, and what is a really key part to it is that in the story or in the photos, they have a necklace that has a key on it. Oh, and so wow. you see it throughout the series that they have this key on them, but I never talk about it to the end. And at the end, they find a hidden book in their room. And it was to me, it kind of represented how fundamentalist they hide knowledge from you, but you can find it if you question, you can wow. go out there and find it. Wow. And so this person finds a book and it shows them that a key can unlock a door and they're, they're, back and it's so important because most of the series are turned to the cross and like at the end they're turned away from the cross and they're mm -hmm. so that was so powerful to me I don't know if people caught on to that but to me wow it just meant like a turning away um a deconstruction and like the walls around them are cracking and breaking mm -hmm. their world is falling apart because they're deconstructing mm -hmm. um but it, it's an awful world it's a nasty world so they need yeah. to get out <laughs> right so they find the key in the very last frame of the photo series is they're putting the key in the lock and that's it. And they're wow. free from their environment because Incredible. they took the initiative to realize that they had the answer all along, that they were their own hero. That's so amazing. That's, yeah. So that was kind of the gist of it, I think, uh, for this. That's series. incredible. Well, I, re I really hope a bunch of people will go to your page yes. and see your work and share your work. I, 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 my last question for you is just, is it okay for us to be doing this Instagram live? Like, is this going to get you in trouble at Bob Jones? I don't care, John. Just okay. post it. Like at this point, it's like I'm just so tired of feeling muzzled. And like, yeah. And, and if and if I get kicked out, I so be it. Like, I, you know what I mean. And I don't think it will happen. It's possible. Like, I'm ready for it if it happens. But you know. I have one semester left. I can transfer. I have a bunch of credits to transfer. Josh, like you know, like at this point, they can't hurt me. At this, like I, yeah. You know, well, but, I just want. I just want to communicate that I am so impressed. I, my oldest uh, child, my daughter is twenty one, and um, you're the same age, and the fact that you are just being so courageous. I see the mm -hmm. same courage in her, actually. So I, I love mm -hmm. that. But I just love, like. I would call it a loving courage, mm. you know, that you're willing to set boundaries with your family. Yes. That you're mm -hmm. willing to be yourself. And, and, you know, it's one thing to, you know, be yourself when there's no cost, but to, mm -hmm. to embrace who you are without fear, you know, mm -hmm. and yes. in a context where there's a lot of pressure to conform. Yes. And then to express what you're, you know, what's what the, the story inside of you mm -hmm. through your art in such a powerful way. Like, I just cannot wait to see what you do in the in the coming days, whether it's as a psychologist, as yes. an artist, mm -hmm. or, you know, in whatever ways, like, I'm just so confident that you're going to be inspiring and helping other mm -hmm. people because you're you're so filled with light and love. And oh, I just, thank you. I just want to, I just want to say I'm a fan and I'm really <laughs> excited for you. Really excited yes. for you. And I, I like, really appreciate you coming uh, on to have this conversation. Yes. And like before, I know we've gone on long, but before, before you um, ended, I just want to say like the same thing to you. Like I've looked up to you for a long time. I remember like basically you came out about leaving Christianity that like yeah. everyone in the community was so upset. Mm. And like secretly, I was so happy about it. And because, <laughs> like, yes, yeah, like someone is sticking up for us. There, you know, oh. I, I admire you because you're willing to see the harm that you caused. Mm. You're willing to admit to your mistakes. Yes, you caused harm with your book, but you yeah. owned it. And you said, I caused harm. And it's, you know, I feel like a lot of people have forgiven the harm you've done because you've come out and you said, I did this harm. I'm trying to fix it. 
I did something mm-hmm. wrong. I'm trying to be better. And I will always look up to people who are willing to own their mistakes. Like I make mistakes. Like I'm still trying to work on myself. I have so much. Well, thank you, me. Andrew. Yeah. So thank you for all that, that means you're a doing, lot that you're doing on the internet and just keep doing what you're doing, honestly. So thank well, you. Well, that's incredible. You did, you made, you made my day. <laughs> oh, and uh, I'm really, really grateful. <laughs> so wishing you all the best <laughs> crush this you. last semester. <laughs> And uh, keep keep making art, keep sharing your story. The world the world needs it. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. Yes. Bye. Bye.